our political culture is in a sick place at this point, um, and people need to be pushing against its instincts to force it to do a little more thinking. Yuval, good to see you. Jonah, thank you. You are a Old friend, but a new addition to AI. You are the director of social, cultural, and constitutional studies. Constitutional right. studies, <laughs> and uh, you are also the editor of founding editor of National Affairs, which is celebrating its tenth anniversary. I'm sure there's gonna be a booze cruise. Of that's, course, that's naturally. how you guys roll. Yeah. And uh, why don't you uh, tell people who do not know what National Affairs is? Um, how you see it, what you think of it, and then I will correct you. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> National Affairs is a uh, it's a quarterly journal of uh, of essays, long form essays on the full range of domestic policy issues, on political economy and political philosophy. It's really its purpose is to help Americans think a little bit more clearly about the challenges that we face as a country, and to do it in a way that now is really countercultural by letting writers think out loud at some length. Um, by taking up problems in a historical context, by taking the future seriously. Uh, and so rather than reacting to the latest outrage, trying to think through to the foundations of some of the challenges we have, the idea is really to be a place where people, particularly people right of center, can, can think out loud together and try to confront the country's problems. So um, this is not something I think you would deny. I think it's something you would proudly boast about, that in many ways, National Affairs is is literally, not just figuratively, but literally the heir to one of my favorite publications of all time. When I first came to Washington, I used to hang out at their offices because I was so cool. Um, the Public Interest, yeah. which was founded by Irving Kristol, praise be upon him, and Daniel Bell. And then after one year, Daniel Bell left and Nathan Glazer yeah. came in. A lot of people don't know who they were or why they were important or why it would be not just something bold and audacious to try and follow in their footsteps, but something noble and necessary. So why don't you tell, me, tell people a little bit about yeah. well, those Yeah, well, it guys. would be much too bold to imagine we could really follow in their footsteps, but they're a model for us. Um, the public interest was founded in 1965 by Irving Kristol and Dan Bell and a kind of circle of people around them who over time became known as the neoconservatives. Um, people who generally moved from the left to the right in response to the great society and who applied social science to public questions in some ways, broadly learned people who tried to understand America's challenges in the latter half of the 20th century. Um, the Public Interest also was a quarterly journal, also published long-form essays and tried to confront some of the challenges the country faced in uh, the 40-year period that it ran from 65 until 2005. They were very much a model for us. National Affairs, in a sense, came out of a series of conversations in 2008 and 9, at the beginning of the Obama era, uh, on the right, about what was missing, what uh, what people felt we needed to respond to a new moment, and a lot of what I was hearing in those conversations was that people needed a place to think out loud in a in a broad and deep way, and a lot of times it was literally people saying that they missed the public interest and that they wish there was something like it, and my thought was maybe there could be something like it, maybe not quite like it, but like it, and we started uh, right after the election of 08 really to think about what that could look like to what degree could be modeled on the public interest, in what ways it needed to be different. We spent a grueling six months or so arguing about what it should be called, mm -hmm. um, which was not my favorite time. But in the, at, at the end, Irving Kristol actually rescued us from that process and said the public interest originally was going to be called National Affairs. They actually created a, uh, a nonprofit corporation to publish it at a time when they thought that would be the name. And so if you look at the public interest over the years, it always says published by National Affairs Inc. And he said to us, the name's right here, the corporation's right here, why don't you just take it over and start a new magazine and call it National Affairs? And that's just what we did. So we are in that direct sense, uh, kind of successors to the effort they had that also means that we own the archives of the public interest and the only condition that Irving Kristol and Nat Glazer put on our taking all this over was that we would make that archive available online for free, which we've done. Uh, it's all digitized and available. It's pretty small affairs. Ask com. in the grand scheme of yeah, things. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they were giving us a gift. Uh, and an enormous gift. That archive is actually very popular. It's, uh, these, you know, it, it, made, it made the public interest available online for the first time. Um, those essays are assigned a lot in college courses. A lot of people do read them. It's an enormous treasury of wisdom and just a, a, an interesting window into 
a period in American history that has a lot to offer us now, but that a lot of people don't really know. The challenges of the 1970s actually in some ways are a lot like the kinds of problems we confront now. And there was a generation of thinkers, uh, including people who would be very rare on the right now, sociologists of whom we have very, very few, historians, uh, people who had moved from left to right and had a, a distinct sort of vision who could help the country think. Uh, and so that's all available at nationalaffairs.com, along with now 10 years of, uh, of our own work trying to follow in those footsteps, obviously knowing we could never quite do it. You said to Chicago Magazine oh boy. at one point <laughs> that you would say national affairs is neoconservative in the original sense, in that it tries to be empirical about what works rather than whose ideology we most agree with. Mm. That's a tall order these days, right? Yeah. I mean, because everybody's demanding ideological conformity is more important than intellectual sobriety or facts. Yeah. Um, how do you cope with that in this environment? Well, I'd say a number of things. First of all, I, 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 I don't think I would quite say that we are simply following what works. I, that kind of argument, right. it, nobody ever really means that. Um, and it sounds too much like pragmatism, which just sort of pretends to have no ideology. We have a point of view. National Affairs is not a partisan journal, but it has a point of view. It, it starts from real confidence in this country, a belief in America, which means a belief in the American political tradition, which is a liberal political tradition. It means a belief that problems are generally best solved by people competing, trying different ways of addressing them, and having a, a system, a market or a market of ideas, that lets, those, uh, that lets that competition work itself out. It means we believe in civil society. We believe in trying to address problems from the bottom up. It means that we, we think we're strengthened by the roots that our society has in the Western tradition. So we have a point of view. And generally speaking, it puts us to the right of center. But that doesn't mean that we're partisan in a strict sense or ideological in a blinding way. I think that we are living now at a time when the, the only way the two parties really understand themselves is as each opposing the other. Right. The only thing that people are sure they are for on the right is that the left should lose and vice versa. And I don't think that's a constructive way to think about politics. And among other things, it means we don't talk about public policy very much. Our politics right now is unbelievably divorced from public policy. We are entering a presidential election year. And nobody's running on anything. Certainly the, the, the president is not. And, you know, in a variety of ways, the Democrats are running on these kind of totems where they, they'll say single payer or Medicare for all. But we're not actually talking about the country's problems. I, I think that part of what we're trying to do at National Affairs is break through that and help people think about the challenges the country faces without forcing them to assume that there are simple solutions to these problems, without forcing them to assume that it's going to be easy to figure it out and if only the other party got out of the way, we would do it. These are actual problems and, you know, th there are resources to work with in our traditions for thinking about these problems. There are ways of thinking about the future that can help us think about these problems. But it, it, it's not partisanship that's going to get us there. And, you know, in that sense, as I say, we're, we're countercultural and I think the, the political culture needs that. Our political culture is in a sick place at this point um, and people need to be pushing against its instincts to force it to do a little more thinking, uh, to be a little more concrete but also a little better grounded and that's part of what we try to do. The problem or the challenge I should say with what you're doing is that it's very much, and I don't mean this in the pejorative sense that people use it in politics today, but it's an elite play, yes. right? Uh, Irving used to joke that um, if, the, if the public interest had more than 7,000 readers, they were doing something wrong. <laughs> Um, do you find that that sort of logic still plays that if you, if you can stay clear of the culture war stuff and the ideological squabbles and the finger pointing and all of that and actually speak peer to peer among elites, that that's a better way to move public policy? Well, I'd say we're, we're proud to have more than 7,000 readers. Uh -huh. It's a little bit easier to Nearly do. Nearly double that. Yes, almost <laughs> on a good day. Um, it's easier to do now with the internet. Yeah. The public interest never really used the internet, even in its final years when it could have or might have. Um, and w what it allows us to do is build a niche audience that's not that tiny. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a niche audience. And certainly we're speaking to people, A, who are going to have the patience to work through a 6,000 word essay on the, the, the roots of our entitlement crisis. Um, that's, a, that's a niche audience. That's just how it is. We don't necessarily think of it as an elite enterprise exactly, just in the sense that, and I think it, in some ways it would be unfair to what the neoconservatives did to say that even that was an elite enterprise, for the reason you suggest, which is a lot of what they did was affirm the instincts of the broader American public mm -hmm. and tell a lot of American elites that they were mistaken to think that, that the public's broad, unarticulated, but deeply held general viewpoint 
uh, was an error and they needed to be corrected by, uh, by the country's cultural elites. In a lot of ways, what they did was actually show that those instincts were rooted in something significant and in something meaningful. The sociology of that era um, was a way of helping to affirm some public common sense. Not always, but often. Um, I think we try to do that too, uh, but without question, we, are, we, we think of ourselves as existing near the beginning of the policy food chain, not near the end. We don't write short, snappy things that people can say on the stump, but we try to help people begin the process of thinking through public policy questions in a way that ultimately may end up with something short and snappy. And some of the things we've done have ended up as public policy and as campaign themes, uh, have been cited by politicians and by judges and other things. But we really try to begin from the beginning and root them in some fundamental uh, facts and figures and questions. And I think that's essential. You can't start the, that, that kind of intellectual food chain in the middle. Somebody has to be doing the, the fundamental work. Um, and, you know, that's a lot of what AI does. That's a lot of what the think tank world does. And it's what we try to be a home for. Yeah. So as, as someone who spends a big chunk of his time as just a lowly pundit, which I understand and your world is one of the lower phylum uh -huh. or phyla of, of public intellectuals. But um, one of the things I find most useful about national affairs is that if I need to get, get up to speed on a subject that I'm knowledgeable about but not up to date on where the argument is or yeah. where the numbers are and all that kind of stuff, the value for national affairs to me is not so much that it's an alternative to the hot take stuff on the internet because I, I know where to find that. It's that it's an alternative to having to read a whole book on a subject, uh -huh. right? Um, and that was one of the the geniuses of, of of Irving Kristol was he never really wrote a real book, right? He he called himself a middle distance runner, yeah. And he only and he wrote the long form essay, which I still think is the most underappreciated form of writing in American life. So much of American life was shaped by pamphleteers, right. by magazine articles, and, and all of that. And the thing I worry about, even among, if you don't like the word elites, policymakers and the like, attention spans everywhere are kind of shrinking. Yeah. Um, and do you, is there any way to combat that other than to just put it out there and see if it gets a bite? Yeah, th this is certainly part of what we try to do, is following that tradition of kind of how-to pieces or how to understand X. Uh, those tend to be our most popular pieces. We had an essay on what is unemployment, and it turned out to be just absurdly popular. Again, a sign in a lot of college courses, read very well, because it basically just explained with a little bit of history, some economics, a kind of reference to contemporary problems, what we actually mean when we talk about unemployment, what we don't mean, what are the different numbers. That kind of thing is, is very popular, and we publish a fair amount of it, and I think it is very useful. It's useful for people who might be experts in one thing, but not in everything, right. and, uh, and, and it allows them to sort of walk into these arguments in ways that, um, that, that let them think about them at a high level. Obviously, the attention span question is on our minds a lot. We publish essays that are maybe on average about 5,000 words, some of them quite a bit longer than that. Um, we have to keep our readers' attention. That's our job at some level. A lot of what we do as the, as the staff of the magazine is translate real academic work into something a little bit more like right. English um, and, uh, and, and help it be a little bit more interesting. But also, at the end of the day, if people don't have the attention for a 5,000-word essay, then they don't have the attention to play the kind of part that uh, a serious citizen ought to play in thinking about these questions. We can't simply change that. But for those who do, we can offer them more than, um, m more than they might get in a traditional policy white paper that requires a lot of expertise, more than they'd get in a, a, a kind of general reader magazine article that is just trying to keep them turning the pages. There is, there is that middle ground. I think there really is room, and it's not just a niche, but it's attractive because there's not much of it for a long form essay, for that middle distance run. That, that does bring you into a subject, let you understand enough of it so that you can see why it's important and how to think about it, what the basic parameters are, who the key people are, what the arguments are. I think that can be enormously important for an informed citizen, but also for a policymaker, uh, for people working in and around politics. Um, it, it's, it's a format that I think has a lot to offer, and especially now, because it's countercultural, because it's not easy to find, because there's not a, a lot, uh, there aren't a lot of options for getting you to that depth. I think it's it, it provides an enormous service. Yeah, so it's funny. Like the kind of pieces I have in mind are the pieces you've done on homelessness or the yeah. opioid crisis, where you can 
get up to speed very quickly in a thoughtful way, while at the same time understanding that the writer is coming from a perspective, which yeah. I think is important. I, I talk to journalism students all the time, and I always argue that the best forms, the best opinion writing, I think, is the best kind of journalism because um, the author isn't trying to hide what their biases are. They're telling the reader or making it clear to the reader where they're coming from on a question. Mm -hmm. And the way I always talk about this is that you can tell if, if someone is an honest writer um, if they accurately describe the position they disagree with in a way that the people they disagree with would say that is a fair encapsulation yeah. of what we believe. And I think that's one of the things that I always trust national affairs to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of magazine articles on the ideological spectrum, across the ideological spectrum, that turn the person they're arguing with, against into a kind of straw man, and then they beat the hell out of the strong man. Um, our friend and AI colleague, Ramesh Panuru, he has this ideal of saying that he wants to f argue with the left's best positions, right. not their worst positions. And so much of conservative and, and liberal, so much of ideological journalism these days is to take up the Medusa's head of the worst position on the other side and say, see, this is what we're yeah. facing. When in reality, smart people who we may disagree with, at Brookings or whoever, they're still fundamentally patriotic people yeah. and they actually care about finding solutions to these things. We just have disagreements about where they're coming from, but there's also a lot of common ground there. Yeah, this is an important assumption behind a lot of the work we do is that the, the people we disagree with are not out to destroy the country. And the point is not to rev people up to stop them from destroying the country. They're, maybe they're misguided about what would be good for it. At the very least, we disagree about what would be good for it. And the pieces we publish are not academic in the sense that they are advocacy pieces. They're writers trying to change something. Um, and they have a point of view and they're arguing for it. They do it seriously and in a way that takes account of trade-offs and of uh, the best arguments of the other side, as you say. But they are fundamentally persuasive arguments. And so the, 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 the ways in which we've had influence over these 10 years have been by introducing ideas into the public sphere that have strong arguments behind them, but that take seriously the, the very complicated trade-offs that politicians have to think about. So we've published important pieces about taxes, for example, some of which were very much reflected in the 2017 uh, tax reform about bringing in some concerns about the ways that, that parenting and families are treated in the tax code. Um, from our very first issue right through the most recent one, that's an issue we've taken up a lot. We've published pieces on higher education that have become public policy. We've published pieces on, we, we had an essay from Jeff Rosen, who's now the Deputy Attorney General, on uh, a regulatory budget which the Trump administration adopted just about as it was mm -hmm. in the magazine uh, in 2018. And so the, the way that you have influence is by taking the kinds, of, the kinds of tensions and problems that policymakers have to think about seriously, but also offering them a point of view, offering them a way forward that they can take to the public or that they can turn into policy. Uh, we're not outside observers. We're active citizens. We're trying to improve the country as we understand it. Um, what are some other examples of... of essays that you've had that have moved the needle on public policy? Well, for example, uh, we've done a fair number of pieces on public sector unions. Uh, a couple of them were cited by Justice Alito in the Janus decision, uh, which started moving that issue uh, lately. We've, had, we, we've done a lot on higher education where there has been some movement in the last few years and some of it was informed by what we've done. National Affairs was at the center of making the case for an alternative to Obamacare uh, in the Obama years and, and since. Um, that didn't happen. It didn't get passed <laughs> by Congress. But that, that, that bill that almost got passed by Congress uh, started out as an essay in our magazine by Jim Capretta, our colleague at AI. Um, we've done a lot in the K-12 through space that's turned out to be important. I think we've, we've worked to fill the, the cupboard of policy ideas on the right since the beginning of the Obama era and now into the Trump era. And it's been a time when not enough attention has been paid to how empty that cupboard has become. Right. Um, and so a lot of what we've done are pieces that are going to be there when it's time, when there's an opportunity to move a policy issue. You know, when, when uh, an, an author comes to me in 2015 and says, I want to write a piece about what happens if Puerto Rico goes bankrupt, my first thought is, that's the least interesting subject <laughs> I could possibly imagine. But we did it. And then Puerto Rico goes bankrupt. And it turns out that piece becomes very in important and significant because somebody's done the work. He's not working under crisis conditions. He had time to think about it. And uh, the ideas were there for Congress to take up. 
that's how we think about the ways we exercise influence. The other piece of what we do are more like think pieces, pieces that try to lay out what's going on in our political culture, what's happening uh, in, 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 our, in our larger culture. Obviously, these 10 years have been a time when there's been, frankly, a, a kind of deformation of the underlying culture behind our politics. And we've tried to help our readers understand what that's about, think about what might be done about it, how it relates to all kinds of institutions and forces that are upstream of politics, from family and community and civil society and religion, um, to the kinds of pressures that are pressing in on our institutions. The weakening of Congress has been a major theme for us. Uh, the administrative state, the judiciary. These are all issues that uh, in some senses are perennial, but that have faced some very unusual problems in this century and that need to be thought about at the level of what people here at AI do and, uh, and, and what we are home for. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny. I mean, for, I mean, part of the reason why we're doing this video is to introduce or reintroduce national affairs. You've just come on board AI, you brought national affairs with you, to people who may not know a lot about it. And, and obviously, they have to be somewhat self-motivated to be interested in this video, never mind in the, yeah. the national affairs. But it does get to this sort of fascinating, very opaque thing to the average citizen about how policy is actually mm. made, right? Yeah. I mean, the classic example which alas wasn't a public interest or a national affairs article, but was uh, co-written by one of the leading lights of the public interest was James Q. Wilson. Yeah. James Q. Wilson co-wrote with a guy named George Kelling, right? Um, an essay called Broken Windows, mm -hmm. which was, the basic argument was that um, human beings are wired to pick up on small cues of disorder. And he pointed out, they argued that if you live in a community where kids can get away with smashing windows of abandoned buildings or even occupied buildings and it doesn't get fixed and there's no punishment, it creates a permission structure to do worse and worse and worse things. And this got translated. It took a while, yeah. but it eventually got picked up off the shelf by uh, a earlier version of Rudy Giuliani, <laughs> uh, not the one the we know. The real Rudy Giuliani. That, the Rudy I, Giuliani that I will we, always think about it. Yeah, that's right, that we know and love. The Rudy Giuliani in our hearts. And... Um, became the bedrock of one of the, I, I think it's fair to say, one of the most socially transformative public policy successes in American history, starting in New York City, but also copied around the country where New York City police and other police departments started enforcing small quality of life issues. Mm -hmm. And as simple as things that, it turns out if you jump turnstiles to get on a subway, you might be the kind of person who commits other crimes that are bigger and you can stop them for that and you talk to them and you find out they got warrants on them. and. And we've seen this precipitous decline in, uh, precipitous has a negative connotation, but we've seen this amazing decline in violent crime in, in homicide and all of these things as a result of the fact that there was this pre-made policy idea that was just sort of sitting around waiting for someone to get in power. And I think one of the things, if I'm gonna help you do your job and um, sell national affairs for people is that if you were a, if you were a stock trader, right, or a financial guy, you read obscure things about new technologies coming down the pike that might not be here for a few years because you want to get early on, get on in early on investing in them. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that at least for the center right, national affairs is not alone, but it's sort of the leader of the pack of a place where you could read about bankruptcy of, of Puerto Rico. And if you if you read it, when that issue ripens, you already feel like you're up to speed and you're prepared to have arguments about it in ways that other people will be caught flat-footed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's just what we try to do. You know, Milton Friedman had a line that said a lot of the kind of, of policy work that economists do is putting things on the shelf. And then years later, a politician runs screaming to them and says, what do I do about this? And they just go say, well, I've got this thing on right. the shelf. That's exactly how we think about a lot of what we a lot of what we try to do. Obviously, we also work to be timely. We work to think about the events of the day in a sense, but the quarterly schedule, which really forces us to be countercultural and not just to respond to the latest outrage, means that when we do take up those kinds of questions, they tend to be the larger question, the more enduring, deeper questions. Um, and when we think about public policy, it is very often in terms of what are the issues that are that are coming down the road, what are the issues that are being ignored and that it's going to be important to understand when the time comes. And that's certainly a lot of what we try to do. Now, a lot of the most widely read pieces of ours are more cultural. I, I, the, the, the most widely read, I just checked this morning, in our 10-year history, was actually an essay by Diana Schaub about baseball. Really? Um, which is a wonderful essay. 
Uh, the third most widely read is also by Diana Schaub about the Gettysburg Address. Huh. Um, so a good writer goes a long way, but yeah. so does a good subject. Um, so certainly we offer readers a lot of, of essays that are about deeper, more enduring cultural questions, a lot about the American founding, its, its implications for contemporary politics. But we also offer policymakers and the people around them and interested citizens ways to think about how to solve problems. And I think these things are deeply related. The, the approach we have to solving problems is very much connected to how we ought to think about the, 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 the deeper uh, and more enduring questions of the nature of the American regime, of the foundations of liberalism, how we solve problems as a society in general. Um, that's where you have to start when you're confronted with a new challenge. You have to begin with your principles. You have to think about contemporary realities. And you have to think about how to apply those principles to those realities. And those three steps are what it takes to, uh, to be an effective policymaker. We try to inform and influence every one of them. As some people might know, I was the founding editor of National Review Online. You know, so in internet years, I'm like Methuselah, right? I've been doing this for a long time. And one of the things that um, the internet allowed you to do was, I don't want to say lower standards, because I think we tried really hard to maintain the standard, but the, there is no shortage of ones and zeros. There is a shortage of dead tree. Yeah. And like, it's so one of the pieces of advice I give to young aspiring journalists is, if you're just getting started, it is much more important for you to get your clips in print publication, literally in print, because it's a tell to other editors that they were willing to sacrifice a finite resource in order to, to use your stuff. It's much easier. You can always throw stuff up on the web, and I think that's one of the reasons why our discourse stinks so bad is in the clickbait traffic culture that the Internet has encouraged over the years. Um, there is this ethos that more is more, yeah. right? And in reality, often less is more. And one of the nice things about print publications is that there's still a, a, a much more defined role for an editor, that this much has to go in and um, there isn't room for this. And it creates editing <laughs> in a way that uh, is sometimes lacking on other places in conservative or, or again, ideological journalism. Um, how do you yeah. deal with all that? So we, we've thought of our existence as a print publication really as a way to discipline ourselves because for, for most of our readers, we're basically an online publication, right? More than 90% of our readership finds us online. And not only that, but finds our essays one by one rather than looking at an issue and saying, this is the spring issue. They'll, they'll find a link or something on Twitter or Facebook and they'll read an essay. Maybe it was published five years ago and maybe it's in the new issue. But from our point of view, we're a quarterly magazine. Um, and we just, when we're, when we're done laying out the quarterly magazine, we put it online. And the reason to think of it that way is, is just as you say, that it forces us to ask, is this really worth publishing? Is this worth publishing in this way? Is this something um, that belongs out now? Uh, and in, in what relation does it stand to other things that are important in this moment? It forces us also to think in terms of a certain level of, of quality in the work we put out. Uh, and so we definitely understand ourselves fundamentally as a print publication. And by the way, it's also important to a lot of our writers. Uh, the kinds of writers we have are people who want to have a CV and want to be right. out in print. And I would say if we got rid of our print version, which would save us a lot of money, uh, we would lose some of our best writers. It's maybe just a, a weird psychological quirk of contemporary uh, intellectuals and academics, and maybe it passes with time. But I find it's very important to understand yourself, again, in, in a somewhat countercultural way um, as representing a kind of culture of print and as having a set of standards that's most appropriate for a print publication. It really affects the quality of what you put out and the nature of what you put out. And so that means being selective. We publish about 10 to 12 pieces every quarter. We don't publish between issues. Um, and that means that a fair amount of uh, what comes in, we end up not publishing. And by this point, you know, at the beginning, the magazine was uh, entirely commissioned. We didn't exist. We needed to find writers. By now, just about everything we publish is over the transom and not commissioned. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I look for writers and ask them what they're thinking about. But very rarely do I ask for an essay because mm -hmm. people know what they ought to be writing about better than I do. Um, and so the job of editing is really selecting. It's really choosing from uh, a lot of potential essays. And that requires a, a certain degree of judgment about what matters now and what fits in the, kind of, uh, in the kind of work we do. You are known 
in some quarters as one of the leaders of the Reformacons, uh -huh. right? Um, and for those who don't know, the Reformacons were a bunch of people like you and Ramesh Panuru and our colleague Michael Strain and, um, and a bunch of other, no offense, men, egghead types who were really eager in, were eager to revisit the suite of public policy choices that we, that Republicans or that we were, that were being debated at the time and update them to the contemporary moment. Uh, a sort of a take, I think I heard you say, um, take Reaganite principles, but apply them to the time that we're living in rather than constantly replaying this nostalgia trip for 1982 as yeah. if that's, things haven't changed. Where is the Reformicon project mm -hmm. now? And if you had to use your crystal ball and think about what you would say in this interview, presumably with somebody else, for the 20th anniversary of um, National Affairs, what would be the kind of issues that if you had your druthers, you think would ripen into yeah. um, the public policy agenda of 2029? Yeah, it's a great question. I, 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 I should say I retired my crystal ball in 2016 when sure. life took a turn for the peculiar. Um, I, I would say the, the Reformicon concept was basically that Reaganism was right for its time, that it applied the right principles, enduring principles, to problems of that time, and that the right agenda today would apply those same enduring principles to a different set of challenges and problems. And I think our politics had a lot of trouble doing that in the 21st century, so that we have been rerunning an agenda uh, rather than reapplying principles to a changing reality. Part of what that meant was that we called for much more of a focus on the challenges that were facing working families, working class Americans, middle class Americans. Um, and I do think that our politics would be in a much better place if the American right had done that in the last 10 years. And of course, in some ways, the 2016 election suggested that that was where the center of gravity was. But the, the turn in that direction was done in a Trumpist way that was not policy oriented, that was rooted in a much darker approach to working class and middle class Americans. And that I don't think ultimately is gonna bear a lot of fruit as a, as a practical matter, including for those people. So that I think the, the need to focus on the challenges confronting working families in America is still there. I think the right is still the natural place where that'll happen um, as the left becomes much more of an elite coalition. And I think there still are a lot of ways that we can apply our core principles uh, to addressing the problems that these working families face so that in 10 years we will have been successful if we focused on some core cost of living issues, especially health care, housing, and higher education, which I think are three areas where there's been enormous inflation in a time when we pretend there's been no inflation in the American economy. A lot of that caused by bad public policy that subsidizes demand while restricting supply in, in housing, in healthcare, in higher education. Um, those things need to change in ways that we've been talking about for a while, in ways that uh, National Affairs has focused on for 10 years. I think that's one core area. I also think that we need to focus on the, the, the fundamental health of our institutions, of our political culture. That's one way in which m my view of where our priorities ought to be has changed over the past 10 years. I, m my thought in 2009, when we started the magazine was that we, we would be getting a lot of people focusing on kind of technocratic problems and would have to force people to focus on bigger issues of culture and political philosophy. And that has not been true. Uh, on the contrary, right now it's very easy to find lots of people who want to opine on the big questions right. about this and that, and very few people who actually want to think about practical problems. I think we need to do both of those things, um, and that in terms of thinking about the deeper or you might say the 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 problems that are upstream of our politics, we need to think about the health of our institutions, family and community and civic institutions, our political institutions, our parties, the Congress. Uh, all of these are in sorry shape, and they are because we have let them wither. And I think that requires a kind of attention that really only conservatives can apply. Right now, we're living in a time when conservatives are hostile to our core institutions. And that just can't be. That's mm -hmm. conservatives failing to do what we can do for our society. We've got to help these institutions become trustworthy again and regain the trust of the public. It's not at all where we're focused. And I think if I had my way, that's where we would be turning in these next 10 years. Not to ascribe pecuniary or selfish aggrandizing motives to you, but I will point out to the audience that you have a book coming out uh, along some of these lines. <laughs> <laughs> um, a time to build, January 21st. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, uh, you've all welcome to AEI. Congrats Thank on 10 you. years of, the na of National Affairs, and may you have at least another 10. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Yuval Levin. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to learn more about national affairs, check the links in the description below.